Okay, hi, I am Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia, and um, we do these series of web history uh, to try to catch a sort of oral history of the web and the people who helped build it along the way so that none of this is, is lost in history. We think it's really potentially interesting. So today I'm joined by my good friend. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, Brian. Thank you. My name is Coralie Mercier, and we've known each other for about 10 years, I think. Yeah. And um, you work at the, we met, you work at the W3C. W3C. Yeah. yeah. I've, um, I've been at W3C for 25 years. 25 years. You can wow. see now that uh, I come with it. <laughs> I, st I started doing administration and now I'm doing uh, communication. So I heard you tell a story one time about how you got uh, introduced to the web, which is like a, a thing that I like to ask in all these web history conversations because it's not a thing anymore, right? It's just like hmm. being introduced to the web today is like being introduced to electricity, right? Like it's just part of the ebb and flow of normal life. So I think in these history things, it's fun to capture like how you went from the time before the web to learning about the web. And you had like a really fun story about how you learned about the web. Do Can you share it? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. So the, um, I, I learned from the web before I actually knew what it was. I learned from the web by looking at the cover of a CD, which I dug for you. All right. <laughs> That's Celine the one. Dion. Yeah. So nice. it, was, it was on the back of the, mm -hmm. the CD plastic thing, and I, I no longer have it, of course, but you can still see it like here at the bottom. And I remember seeing, for more information, connect with Sony online at http colon slash slash www.sony.com. And I thought, oh, I'd like to connect with Celine. She's, I, I'm a fan of hers. Huh. And I was, I don't know, 19 or 20. Anyway. Mm. And I thought, ah, it doesn't look like a, an address or a phone number. And I just uh, puzzled over it for a while. And then uh, forgot entirely about it because I didn't actually go to the web until maybe two, um, maybe three years later. I I had to look this up because you know preparing for this, we, we shared some notes and things. I had to look it up because that was I think you said nineteen ninety six or five nineteen ninety six or six. Yeah. So like the W three C started in late 1994 right and yes like the following year the stats that i find say that like one fifth of the united states and maybe one tenth of the uk those are just the only ones i could find it readily um had access to the internet at all but like the web even in that was fringe because mostly what that meant was email right like you had access to email academics yeah right yeah and um, it was internet use the web was really fringe so that's like impressive to me i wonder how that came about that like sony already was like like who at sony thought yeah. we should put that on it probably was celine she was it could be yeah i don't know if uh, others i don't know if others did it before i don't know if sony did it for all of the artists that they produced and it's very true in um According to the figures that we have in 1994, it was mostly the U.S. and Canada, which were which had access to the Internet. And it was uh, about one million users. So then like a few years later, you did get introduced to the web. To the Internet. Like, oh, to yeah. The internet, yeah. To the Internet. Yeah, sure. I, uh, yeah. I got introduced to the Internet before I, I discovered the web. And I didn't even know they were part of the same. I mean, they were, I, I didn't know the web was an application of uh, the internet, but I, mm -hmm. I started to, I started to use IRC when I was in uh, university. That was in 1996. That's amazing to me. I didn't like use IRC or maybe I did, um, but I didn't, I didn't think of it as our IRC um, hmm. until W3C. Ah, yeah. Yeah, because we use it. Yeah, it's so you I mean, uh, it's very resilient and uh, it runs in uh, even in 
a text program, which is how I run it still today. So, and we have built a number of tools that uh, let us do things like uh, bots to transform stuff that gets written in IRC mm -hmm. into HTML minutes even. So yeah, we rely on it. Yeah, CSS Working Group especially has a lot of bots and yeah. things that post them to GitHub issues and all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, so like, how did you come to... To know of it. Yeah. 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 That was an interesting... I mean, I feel lucky to be able to tell that story, but because I think I heard it from uh, the other guests that you had on this podcast. Like them, I uh, was the benefi beneficiary of uh, incredible luck. The, the people I used to hang out with when I was uh, in Edinburgh at university knew people who worked at INRIA. And INRIA was the first host of uh, W3C, but I did not know that then. They were looking for a secretary, and uh, I came back from uh, Scotland, and I was looking for a job, and they said, oh, you should apply there, which I did, and I got the job. And it, that was 1990, 1998, and it was a six-month um, gig. And uh, then I was, uh, I was gone for a, another few months, and they called me again saying, W3C is looking for, uh, to hire someone because Inria wants to reclaim the stuff that they lent them. And I applied and I got the job and that was uh, January, 1999. Well, when you were there, you were exposed to like a lot more tech nerdy stuff, right? Oh yeah. And I, I came from a pretty nerdy family already. Like my dad, my, my dad got, got us um, a Commodore 64 when my, my, my twin brother and I were kids. So we used to play pinball on it and stuff, but my dad used to do serious stuff. Like he would, uh, he would use the computer and then we had other computers, but he would use the computer and program in visual basic or something else because he was a doctor and uh, he had to fill a number of forms and he had decided that it was going to be easier to have the form in the computer so that he would just need to type something once and then recall that information. So every patient he was following had um, a file. And then he had um, made it so that all of the form form forms for social security could be printed on a, on a dot matrix printer. And he created that, uh, that program. So I came from a nerdy family, but the level of nerdiness that I encountered while at INRIA was, <laughs> uh, I mean, it was uh, nothing like... Uh, I mean, I was not prepared for it, of course. I think I told you the story of the 1998 World Cup ch um, Soccer Championship, which... Yeah, uh, I was hoping you would tell that story. <laughs> yeah. So uh, um, I was... Uh, the the workstation I was using then was a SunSpark uh, uh, station. And it was equipped with a bunch of uh, Unix programs. So I got to familiar with uh, that environment, which I knew nothing about. But a lot, well, my point is that a lot of things were done through the terminal, including watching the soccer world championship in ASCII. That's amazing. I don't know how they did it, but uh, you visited some, I think it was some, I don't know if it was FTP or something else, but it was from the, from the terminal. And what you saw, you had to go a little further back from the computer in order to be able to imagine that th this was TV, but it was ASCII being morphing in front of yourself. I don't remember whether I, I don't remember what we did for sound. I, I have the impression that we had to maybe listen to the radio. I don't think it came from the terminal. Anyway, I thought that was crazy, and I told my dad when I came back, <laughs> "We did this at work today," and it was like. Uh, uh, recess, school recess. Right. Did you learn a lot uh, working in that environment? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Because uh, I was uh, I was quite young, and everything that I had learned at school did not was not useful to me then. So I had to learn new things, and uh, working with a scientific team in, involved doing a number of things, including um, producing reports. So I learned LaTeX before. I knew what uh, HTML was, and I don't think even at the time, I, I recall that we used um, intranet more than we use extranet. So 
there was not a lot of things I needed for my work then. It was not W3C then. There was not a lot that I needed to be on the web for. Intranet was sufficient. So I learned LaTeX. I learned how to work with people, work in English, of course. So then in 99, you went to W3C. Yeah. And I also, you know, just to keep the perspective, I looked up the same statistics that we were just talking about. And it seems like at that point, already about 26% of the U.S. had internet at home and about 15% in Europe. 2% in China I was able to find. But like, also, that's the year that Napster came out. Mm. Remember? Yes, Remember I Napster? do. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah Napster I was that. wild. It was fun. And probably all of us got way too many songs that yeah, yeah. had the best I, music library for those couple of years. <laughs> Some of what we did with Napster was still stuff that we're in a weird way on the web trying to catch up to because like, you know, it was like peer sharing, you know? Yeah. Um, and it was like, it was. yeah, yeah. And so like uh, you could create and share from like from your device. And, and that was like something that like even Tim's original browser was like part of the vision. Like you could edit with a kind of WYSIWYG in the browser. Yes. And yeah, I think that that translated over into W3C project at first too, right? Wasn't there a... Amaya? Yeah, Amaya. Yeah, Amaya was, uh, yeah, Amaya is, uh, was. Maybe some people continue to, to use it. Um, We've decommissioned it because we stopped maintaining it since uh, HTML5. Amaya does not support HTML5, so we we made it open source and uh, this, well, we put the source available so in case people want to port it. But uh, Amaya was uh, the first and possibly the only WYSIWYG editor. Like you could edit while you were browse- browsing, pretty much like a, even better than a wiki because in the wiki you have to go through the edit interface. So it was uh, different. But yes, Amaya Amaya was a great browser and I used it many, many years. And I think I stopped using it and moved to Emacs just when we stopped maintaining it, I guess. Yeah, I think also like, I guess sites have gotten more complicated because they involve like JavaScript and CSS as well. Um, But even in that, like we have like dev tools, and yeah. it's there. They're still even those are not connected in the same kind of integrated way that they were in early. Um, I don't know if do you remember like Netscape also had. Oh yeah, Composer. Yeah, Composer. Right. I do. Yeah, I, I think I used that the first. Yeah, I think I I recall using it. I mean, when I purchased my first, when I rented my first domain name, I think the I started with that. I think I might have too, actually. Yeah. yeah. And I found it great, and I, I, I still feel the hole in me that mm. uh, this uh, particular tool left because it was not replaced, as far as I can tell. That's actually an excellent way to segue, because also that year, uh, Blogger came out. That, ah, was, like, that was the year yeah. Blogger came out. Blogger was nice. Uh, did you use Blogger? Yeah, yeah, I did. I had a couple of blogs. Yeah, it was. I think it was like... A way to fill a similar hole, right? Like you could you could publish as well. Like it wasn't in it wasn't the browser doing it, but it was using the browser technology. Yes, totally. And you didn't have to worry about the hosting. Somebody would host it for exactly. you. Yeah, exactly. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. And then came uh, uh, WordPress must have come much later, but I recall also moving from uh, Blogger. Well. I didn't really move from Blogger because I kept that, uh, that that blog, but I tried the my opera my dot opera dot com community, which was exactly the, the same. They they mm-hmm. offered you space, uh, they offered you the tool, which was exactly the same. Well, exactly the same, same mechanisms as uh, Blogger used, and I really loved it. And they then they they sunset it at some point. Yeah. So now I know you. You still have a blog because I, do, yeah. I follow it. <laughs> but it's uh it's WordPress, right? It's a, yes, it's a self-hosted uh, WordPress and I don't yeah. like it. I don't, you like, don't it. like it. No, I don't. You have a lot of posts though. 
right? I do yes, because I I ported all of the I ported to it all of the blog posts which I had uh, created and wanted to keep. At the beginning of blogging, I don't remember. I don't I don't know if you remember a software work that was called Blogsum. No. And I no okay so. Um, it was at the time when we had uh, Bloxom, movable type, really the early uh, era of blogging. And what I liked about Bloxom was that it could run on my machine and the post could be just local. I, I would not publish them. So I used that as a diary. But some of the posts I liked. And I so I, I got those. I got the um, My Opera posts. Some of the some of the posts which were on uh, WordPress and I moved everything together. So that 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 blog published in uh, I don't know 2005 maybe, mm -hmm. and I have about 500 posts. I try to post maybe once a month now. I used to post post a lot more. So now we have like Activity Pub, yeah, and. Um, some ideas including one that you know was uh kind of created championed by uh, tim berners lee uh you know all, a lot of similar ideas in w3c that hopefully will you know get uh some agreement on and and but ways to like own your you know these are ways to like own your data uh more and uh we're in like activity pub, you know, working in owning your social media presence and everything as well. Right. Like, yeah, I think it will be interesting to see what happens there because I do think that, um, you know, some of those early ideas about like you being a, a publisher as well as a subscriber, you know, and then you owning that and not being like just what was on your Twitter or what was on your, blogger or you know whatever um it's really valuable yeah um, yeah it's as though you remember the web dot something trends mm -hmm. web dot web dot two or two mm -hmm. two i don't remember because which we, we try i try not to use them because they are kind of meaning well i find them meaningless because they have meaning different meaning for mm -hmm. different people so one of the one of that era was uh putting stuff on the web and then it became something more complex. And I think we are at the, I, I hope that we are at the tail end of the complexity because you mentioned before how web editing became complex. And I remember when we used to look at the source code of a website in order to make your own website and mm -hmm. the, 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 the homepage I have on the W3C website today for maybe my team page, I, I built exactly like that. I looked mm -hmm. at uh, somebody's uh, CSS and uh, I tried to understand how it worked and, and, and do it. So, and, and then all of a sudden we could no longer do that. It became, mm -hmm. or I could no longer do that. It became too complex. So I think we are, I hope we are at the tail end of uh, that era where we can go back to a more manageable mechanisms and ways so you you probably followed that uh, teams uh, what is it a startup he created a startup called In interrupt and he wanted to work on a concept which he calls solid so he he wanted that to have some kind of standing and use the the process which he developed for the consortium that he founded so after a year or two of uh, trying to make this fit in a way that uh, the the broadest set of stakeholders can look at it, I think we eventually got there with the creation of a working group, which is not called Solid for obvious reasons, but it's called a linked web storage uh, working group. And uh, that is just getting started now, like uh, we started it last week or something. Yeah, there is this. Yeah, it'll be super, super interesting to see what happens there. Yeah. Um, so you've been at W3C now since 1999. What was like the first big thing that you did at W3C? Like what was 
Do you remember your first tea pack? Yes. I remember my first tea pack. It was in 2000 and I helped uh, uh, arrange it. Back then I was uh, part of the administrative team and uh, organizing meetings was a strength of mine. And I, I got to partner with uh, colleagues in the United States. We worked using wikis in order to do more efficient work. So um, I remember my first tea pack and I also remember the second because I organized it completely solo. It was in 2001, the first wow. of a long series of uh, TPAC meetings, technical plenary and advisory committee meetings that would be held in Mondelieu, which is in the southeast of France, in a huge hotel by the beach. So that was really nice. Yeah, I remember it. <laughs> yeah. That's really nice. I've I've never been to one there, so looking oh, forward to that one. I thought you had uh, at least seen seen it. We stopped in uh, I think two thousand eight. Yeah, yeah. I think my my first tea pack was twenty twenty twelve. Twenty twelve. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So you yeah, you could not have uh, seen it. Yeah. So you started your website in the about the same time, right? Um. Yeah, I think so. Two thousand two or something. But it was not, I mean, my website is not a big deal. I just wanted it to learn. Basically, I, I wanted to learn. And it's more to have fun with it and uh, be able to share links to photos with my family mm -hmm. than anything else. So I think the first big thing I did at W3C was to put W3C on social media, really. I mean, yeah. I did a bunch of things and I... Yeah, I, I kickstarted a number of things at W3C and a number of processes and how. So it's really background work, like uh, the way we do work. I did a lot of that to streamline processes or create new processes. But that's something that uh, nobody sees. It's just background stuff. But uh, putting W3C on social media and getting Tim Berners-Lee an account on Twitter is visible. So I was the one suggesting this and <clears throat> doing this. I think I... <clears throat> still have his uh, password. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I don't think he changed it because uh, I tried once. <laughs> <laughs> He's not on there so much anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think W3C has left Twitter as well now, right? We have, yes, uh, in December last year. Mm -hmm. And yep. uh, we've, uh, yeah, we, we, ch we chose to be just on Mastodon and we are hosting our own instance and on LinkedIn because... Sure. It's the place to be, right. but we we started on uh, we started on uh, social media in 2010, possibly even earlier, because when Identica was released, I think it was before 2010. It could have been as early as 2008 or nine something. So we were on Identica, which is the grandparent of uh, Mastodon. Oh, really? I didn't. Yeah. Know. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Evan Prodromo, who launched That's right. That's Identica, right. was also had a say in uh, uh, Activity Pub. So it's been a long love story. That that's right. Yeah, I do remember that actually. Um, so since 1999, at least you know from the outside, it seems to me that like a lot has changed in the world and a lot has changed yes. in the W3C. Yeah. Like, can you tell me like, what are some, yeah. I mean, tell me some ways that you think that the W3C has evolved. Like what, what's some interesting history that you've seen in sort of the evolution of W3C? I think the if I if I had to say one thing, I would say that I witnessed we witnessed the the whole tech ecosystem going from followers who were following W three C staff, mm -hmm. which were the experts, and then there was a shift when everybody caught up, and now the experts are everywhere. So the dynamic had to shift at some point. It was, uh, I think it was rather organic, but uh, I remember that shift and there was a bit of unsettled. We were unsettled at some point, not, not realizing. I mean, it, all, of a sudden it all of a sudden it became clear, like we are no longer the experts. 
So there was this shift, and I don't exactly remember when that was, probably between 2005 and 2010, probably closer to 2010. So there was that. I also, if there is a second thing I could say, is that we noticed a massive surge of the work. Like at first we had, I don't know, maybe 20 working groups, and we thought that was a lot. And today we have more like uh, 50 and 10 interest groups. Mm -hmm. And we think it's a lot. Maybe there is a time in the future when uh, our staff increases and as well uh, as our capacity to, to, to spawn new groups increases as well. So there was this uh, constant increase in the number of groups that we create. And we don't create groups for the sake of... Uh, creating groups, we create groups because there is uh, some matter for a specific group to look at. So they may be bundled in one uh, our, a specific area doing pretty much the same thing, but they are all uh, different. And then there are other areas which have nothing to do with uh, one another. So yeah, we noticed all as well that, uh, uh, that surge. And it's because the web has become more powerful and is becoming still more powerful with the amount of things you can do with it. Yeah. I think the creation of community groups and interest groups itself was a shift from yes. before that, right? Because before yeah. that, there was only working groups and you like tall order to start up a working group like, or taller order because you do have to have, um, I guess, more consensus more agreement that that's a thing that we're going to do and bandwidth more buy-in <laughs> yeah and opportunity as well because mm -hmm. the yeah i think that uh, you're right that community groups which we launched in 2012 i think or 11 offered people an opportunity to gather and rally around new ideas and incubation whereas before there are uh, there were fewer opportunities and uh, or it was like fringe fringe uh, innovation and mm -hmm. niche pro pro probably as well so community groups were a way for new ideas to be socialized and uh, incubated and a number of uh, working groups since then have been uh, spun out of community groups mm -hmm. and specs uh, packaged by community groups for working groups. So that's very interesting. Another thing that I think probably a lot of people don't know that maybe we can talk about. It shocked me that like there was no, like you had to be a legal entity to join the W3C. Ah, but yeah. the W3C itself was not a legal entity. It was this like loose affiliation of, yeah. um, you know, academia basically, uh, yeah. hosts. But now that's another change that's happened, right? Like in the past couple of years, W3C has become a legal entity. Yes. So you're, I think you're tackling two related but different things. The, okay. You have to remember that the consortium was created in 1994. It was created, mm -hmm. uh, it was spurred by Tim Berners-Lee himself. He mm -hmm. re started to realize that there was a need to get the the key players together so that the 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 output of their work to the for the not the infrastructure of the web but how the infrastructure of the web is used could be coordinated mm -hmm. and that was that the model that they used was uh, based on the x consortium so it was a uh, it was a member consortium so you had to be an organization yourself so I don't know whether you're talking so much about uh, this aspect, which uh, mandates that in order to become a member mm. of the World Wide Web Consortium, you have to be uh, an organization, but it's not actually true. What we are lacking is a fee for individuals. So mm. any individual is welcome to join. And we've had one, maybe two one. in the past one individual who joined uh, as an individual turned out they had to pay as a small company because we have not priced it because we work the 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 level at which we we, we operate is more 
to the level of our big organizations who create products that are used on the web than at the individual levels. But you and I both know that there is uh, improvements which could uh, be made and that the voice of individuals could be heard. And you and I did try with a number of others to create something which at the time we called Webizen, mm -hmm. which would allow for a reasonable fee individuals to actually have a voice. Because at W3C, we have been welcoming participation from everyone and we've done the work in the open and we have, I mean, our process mandates us to take in the input from the public, which happens at any time on the recommendation track, but at particular times, which we call review times. So we do that, but we can overrule that, uh, that feedback. Whereas when uh, member um, weigh in, they weigh in with the power of their right, uh, which is we call reviews also, which is confusing, but their review has uh, some power. Mm -hmm. You said W3C changed and became its own legal entity. It's true that for 28 years we were the partnership of four academic institutions. Uh, started at MIT and then INRIA became the second host for Europe and then KO in Tokyo became the Asian host and in 2000, so that was in, uh, uh, I don't remember the dates, but uh, maybe 1998 for INRIA or no, 1996 or something. And then a couple of years later for Japan. And then we had to wait till 2013 for China to join as a host with uh, Beihang University. And 28 years after, boom, we created um, W3C Inc. It was uh, at the beginning of last year. And we are a 501c3. I think that's really exciting. I yeah. think that part is really exciting because it goes to this, like, you know, we're still figuring out how, how, to, how to do all this. Yeah. You know? And I think um, one of the things that we realize, you know, 30 years in is that like we probably could use some more ways to fund this work you know yeah. and yeah. um making something after you know after having 30 years worth of trying to fundraise and do all these different things one of the bits of feedback that i've heard a lot because uh you know galia does uh you know we work on open source for uh for other companies we work on web standards on behalf of other companies. And um, one of the things that I've heard a lot is that it would be easier for companies to do work like this if there were sort of like um, tax incentives to do it um, hmm. so that ah. it made them more, it made the work more um, sort of revenue, like neutral. It made it, it, made it um, seem like less of a, a hit that you have to take as a business. So yeah. if there were some some advantages, not advantages, uh, incentives to this work, then uh, it might be easier. And um, it will be interesting to see uh, how true that is with W3C. I hope that it is very, um, I hope that it is very true. Like there are good reasons for uh, big organizations and small organizations to, uh, fund w3c because you can uh make it a charitable donation so yeah making the incorporating in the us as a 501c3 means that for us organizations mm -hmm. they can be tax exempt so that's already the case and i think that a number of uh us based organizations have taken advantage of it uh, i don't think it's true of other uh, areas uh, yet but uh, the, the point I also wanted to make sure to tell you is that by, so W3C is turning 30 years old, like in three weeks. Um, so we are an old organization, but we resprung as this. Hey, legal entity. not old. <laughs> Come on now. I'm going to open a parenthesis and uh, digress just a little bit. But when I was hired in uh, uh, 
well, I had my, my job interview at the end of 1998, but when I was hired, I heard something like, uh, we're really keen to have you, but you have to know that uh, a consortium has a lifespan of about 10 years. So wow. enjoy it, enjoy it while it lasts. So wow. it, it, this is the perspective I'm coming from when I say that uh, W3C is uh, that old because the, and it may be that the things have shifted, but uh, consortia, consortia have a lifespan of 10 years. So end of the digression, um, the, the opportunity of relaunching as a 501c3 and a public interest nonprofit also gives us an opportunity to decide perhaps how differently we may want to do things. Uh, focus on uh, things that previously we may not have been in a position to do, like mm -hmm. focusing so much, uh, much more on uh, human rights or sustainability. I don't think, that, and we've tried some, uh, not that, but we've tried in the past to um, convince our members to follow us in a particular path, and that has not worked. And maybe this time, because we are kind of respringing, we can, uh, I mean, we can write our own story for the next 30 years. I, I think this is actually a really interesting thing because um, it's, again, part of the whole like evolution. So, you know, we start with W3C, we have like HTML, CSS came pretty quickly, MathML and SVG were very early. And then we got like accessibility as a focus in W3C in when was it 97 yeah 97 yeah and you know now we have uh you know some of the things that w3c helps organize and has experts in even yeah like uh internationalization IAT, yeah, yeah. internationalization go ahead yeah yeah i18n internationalization uh that's been that's maybe from 2000 uh sorry not, not 2000 1998 as well so mm -hmm. it's one of the early we call that uh, horizontal work. Uh, do we? Yeah, we call that horizontal work because it spans uh, everything, like uh, potentially every tech, every specification will have to dab into a number of uh, specific areas. Accessibility, of course, internationalization, because it became uh, clear that there was not just Latin alphabet to be used on the web. So in order to welcome the scripts, even the writing directions, be inclusive of all these cultures. So it became obvious that we had to have some uh, experts and continue to have uh, experts. We had Richard Ishida as lead of that activity for many, many years, and he retired last year. And Fu Chao Shue um, picked, up the, picked up the slack. But we have other uh, similar areas like uh, privacy and security, which have been very long going as well at uh, W3C. And we're hoping to create new ones in addition to the, the, the these four. In particular, sustainability. We just hired <coughs> a few people to look at uh, privacy, security, and sustainability. Privacy and security because we had a gap to fill from many years ago. And sustainability, because that's something we've uh, or wanted for a long time to dab into, because we think it uh, it matters. Just the same way we think security, privacy, internationalization, and web accessibility matter. Also, I've personally be a very strong proponent at W3C of uh, doing more for human rights, and we're, I'm hoping that uh, I can continue to convince uh, the right people for I don't know maybe something next year. I guess we should probably share because it's not a given that everybody knows the w, like how the W3C works or um, since we're recording this for posterity, you know, maybe a hundred years in the future, somebody has no idea what the W3C was like at this time. Yeah. I'm sure they'll still be around. <laughs> but uh, so when we, when a working group produces a, a spec and it, and it wants to advance in the stages, it, one of the things that has to happen is wide review and it's sent out and it, you have to have as part of the process, um, yeah. you know, internationalization, security, privacy reviews. Um, 
accessibility reviews. So it's all part of this thing, like you were saying, called, you know, like wide review. Um, yeah. We look for the minority report before yeah. I learned about the movie. The minority report in yeah. the context of the W3C work was that small uh, voice, that small amount of voices, which were all saying the same things, which was quite different from the majority report. And we tried to to make that match. So the, the, the staff at W3C have the expertise to foster uh, the right conversations to, to happen. Yeah. H hinging on uh, something which we call the W3C process document, which is a specification as well and mm -hmm. specifies how specifications are made. So it's very meta. Uh, the staff has the expertise to lead the working groups through that in addition to having the overview of the rest of the working groups so as to use their position as staff contacts to just make sure that things go the right way or give the right flags at the right time. That's what uh, we do. So you mentioned um, like sustainability and human rights. Um, you had told me that you did... Uh, some volunteer work, like Red Red Cross volunteer work in, yeah. in this vein. Tell tell me about that. I that was before my that was before my work time actually. That was when I was in still still at school. My twin brother wrote me in it. He said, "Oh, it's fun. Uh, we'll do some uh, volunteer work at the Red Cross, uh, helping people, learning also new things." And so that started several years of uh, me going every week or every month at the Red Cross and uh, becoming part of a, a community. Uh, it was then that uh, I started to think, oh, I want to, to, when I grow up, when I'm an adult, I want to work in uh, the human humanitarian, uh, for a humanitarian NGO, and I want to travel and help people. One of the things I also did learn there was to give first aid and uh, to handle crisis. And as part of the training that uh, that I got there, I learned about such thing as triage and uh, choosing the right uh, priorities given uh, co compared to any any situation or context. And uh, that has helped me immensely. Uh, I didn't know then, of course, that uh, it would become uh, helpful to me, but uh, it. It shaped a number of uh, the ways I approach uh, things. And later, many years later, I was doing some kind of assessment of uh, my career. And the, the, the guy I was doing that with told me after three weeks of uh, consulting every week, you are right where you need to be. You wanted to do humanitarian work. You're doing some kind of humanitarian work. So that. And I realized, yeah, that's right. And I remember from many years ago when we, we used to say W3C is the United Nations of the web. And I don't think that I don't think that um, analogy continues to to be true, but it was really true as then, circa 2000 maybe. So yeah, I think I'm I think I'm right where I want to be. I continue to be in awe of the the, the mission that we. That we have, we are a nonprofit. We operated like one before, although we were not. So, yeah, things are falling into place. What is an effort or two that, like, if you can say this, if you can't, that's fine. But that you 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 saw, you know, come through that, you know, stalled or is is hung up or. Um, just never came to fruition or whatever yeah. that you thought, boy, that was really exciting, you know, without plugging for a, a group or technology or anything, but just like an idea or, you know, like, is there, is there anything? Yeah, I can think of two. And um, one, I probably want to go deeper than the other, but uh, I remember from years ago, we were kind of hopeful to be able to have an influence in policy. So we wanted to charter a policy interest group which mm. was going to look at, uh, it was many years ago, like 2008 or something like this. Uh, it was expected to look at ethical things and uh, that's the kind of uh, policy uh, work that uh, we wanted to do, just to make sure that uh, technical standards were technical and policy met, basically. 
That's really interesting. Could be that uh, this chapter, which uh, was never published, may uh, see the light of day. I, I don't know. Or maybe we do this differently. But um, at the technical level and feature level, one thing which um, I've been keen uh, about is uh, monetization on uh, off and on the web for the web ecosystem in, on the one hand, but also for the individuals using it or living uh, of it. So, yeah, I remember micropayments, the efforts in micropayments and micro donations. Yes, that's uh, that's something that I continue to be interested in. So if anybody has read my recent blog, you know that preparation for this uh for this is uh, where that uh, came from because uh, Corley sent me a, a, a hole to fall down and I just fell and just kept falling. And then uh, eventually she sent me a text that said, uh, you're very far down in the hole. <laughs> Maybe I would like a rope instead of another link. Instead of mornings. <laughs> Yeah, you were you were very surprised that micropayments was a work area at W3C even before I joined mm. in 1998, yeah. in 1997. Yeah. So thanks so much. I, I hope that this is like interesting to other people. Um, if not, you know, I anytime I get to chat with you, uh, have a great time. And Me too. I'll see you next week, I guess. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Thank you for having me, Brian. Thank you for coming on. Mm -hmm.